Good morning, dear saints and blessed Ascension Tide. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Monday, May 13th, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. In the Proverbs that we're going to cover today, Proverbs 17, 1 through 14, Solomon imparts wisdom on the virtues of peace and understanding and the dangers of folly. Well, that seems to be the common theme so far. But in these verses, he highlights the value of a quiet home over a house filled with strife, the importance of discerning lips and wise actions, and the destructive nature of quarrels and foolishness. Well, whether you're listening over the air, Uh, in St. Louis, live or on demand at kfuo.org or through the KFUO mobile app, there are so many ways to connect. No matter how you're connecting, I'm just glad you're here. So thank you for tuning in, and thank you for sharing your love of the program and KFUO with your friends and family. So settle in, open your hearts and your minds. We are about to begin. Thy Strong Word is supported in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, an organization dedicated to empowering Lutheran communities worldwide through the translation, publication, and distribution of crucial Christian texts. Discover the far-reaching impact of LHF by visiting them online at lhfmissions.org. And if you have any questions or comments about today's show, there are three ways to reach out by email at pastorboo at gmail.com, through Facebook, or by phone. That phone number is 1-800-730-2727. Well, joining us this morning, it's the Reverend David Bass. He's the pastor of St. Michael Lutheran Church and School in Fort Myers, Florida. Welcome to the program, Pastor Bass. Good morning, and it's great to be here again. Thank you. Yes, I'm I'm glad that we finally were able to connect. We had a few technical difficulties, but now now we're off and running. Uh, Today's uh, episode is going to be covering the new chapter. That's going to be Proverbs 17, the first 14 verses. Well, I tell you what, why don't we just go ahead and have a prayer and dive in since we're a little late getting started. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that your word is eternal and firmly set. We thank you for Solomon. We thank you for the wisdom that you have given to us, a timeless wisdom by which we still learn and grow in our faith and our knowledge, not only towards you as our Lord and Savior, but also towards one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Bless our time in this text this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, here we are, chapter 17. We've been making a good progress through Proverbs, and a lot of the same themes keep coming up again and again. One of those themes in wisdom literature in general is the promotion of contentment and peace over material wealth, that is, material wealth, and I guess no contentment. So that's that first uh, first proverb here, seventeen one from the English Standard Version. Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Take us through that. It's, uh, it's almost like we need to uh, hear these proverbs uh, again and again and again, isn't it? Because no matter how advanced we become, uh, technologically, it, it seems that this proverb here, 17 and verse 1, uh, still bears much weight even in our our culture and our time and day. So, uh, yes, uh, looking at verse 1, the, the possible rendering there, uh, better a dry crust with peace and quiet uh, than a house full of feasting, uh, it's possible that these were uh, peace offerings uh, that, that were made, um, and then the leftovers would go to uh, to the house where everyone would gather for, for fellowship, but sometimes that would get out of control. And so Solomon is saying, you know what, it's, it's probably much better, no doubt it's better, uh, to, to just have a dry piece of crust with some peace and quiet rather than all this sumptuous food and, and, and this meal of every imaginable good gift and blessing, but yet there's strife, there's strife at the table. There's, there's arguing, there's, there's discontentment. It's, it's like going uh, and expecting a, a nice, a nice lunch or a nice dinner at a, a fancy restaurant. You've taken your bride out uh, or, or, or your, your best friend, and you're hoping for a nice quiet meal, but everyone else has maybe had a 
spew too many libations or whatever, and there's <laughs> argument happening, and, and it's just not enjoyable. And so you say, you know what, we'll we'll uh, we'll just stick with the bread that was put on the table, and and uh, we'll just leave to go find a different place to to dine at. And so it is with with life. Uh, this this certainly is not speaking of of a restaurant, a public place, but within the home, under the roof of of our homes, as 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 God calls us to live together with one another, not arguing and quarreling, but rather getting along. You've already kind of mentioned it, but that word feasting there really is the Hebrew word that refers to animal sacrifices. So, I mean, sacrifices, especially big lavish ones, uh, required a certain amount of wealth. This is why God provided for those who didn't have a lot of wealth for very simple and small sacrifices that still were obviously uh, just as uh, pleasing to him. But yeah, it seems like the idea here is that it's better to have even a life full of poverty, poverty, pardon me, mm -hmm. than a lavish, wealthy existence. But yeah, there's just so much conflict. And well, the word they use is strife. And, and, you know, and we hear that in our culture, we hear things like, well, money can't buy happiness. And then you hear a comedian, at least I heard I'm, I'm traveling, coming up to a pastor's conference. I was listening to the uh, comedy station on the Sirius uh, radio. And uh, he says, whoever said that money doesn't buy happiness uh, is wrong, at least in this country, because it, it can at least rent it for a while. And, and well, that might be true with some carnal desires. And let's be honest, you know, if we had a ton of money, you might think, well, there are a whole list of things that I wouldn't worry about anymore. But does that really bring, and I'm not going to say happiness, but let's say contentment. Does that really bring peace in a household? Uh, maybe if, if you have wealth and faith, but there's so much temptation. I heard a study once that said most Americans, if asked, no matter where they fall in the tax brackets, they all said they would be content or happy with just 30% more. So if you have hundreds of millions of dollars, they're like, yeah, just 30 percent more. Or if you're making 30 grand a year, you're like, well, just 30 percent more. I'd be pretty satisfied. So but but no matter where you're at on the scale, you always want a little more. Right. Well, and and, and again, here's here's a, you know, Solomon uh, who, who has seen it all and experienced it all. And, and, and yet we look at this this wisdom of, of a dry crust, which appears initially very unappealing, even to our palate. Um, but if the, the result of that is peace and quiet, I, I think even in our day and age, I, I think most people, uh, you know, I'm not sure if Barna has done studies on this. Maybe he should. Uh, he should do studies on, on uh, Proverbs and, and see where people's contentment lies and say, would you be happier? Would you have more peace and quiet with less rather than the level of strife that you're dealing with because you have so much? Um, where would where would we lie on that? Where would we end up? I, I, I suspect that if the truth be told, we would say, Give us the dry crust because we just want peace and quiet. Oh, amen to that. You know, and, and now the second verse, verse two, it deals with a situation that I don't think that we're very comfortable with. We don't have servants and that sort of thing. We don't necessarily follow the traditions of, of oldest or firstborn sons uh, having some preeminence in the family. Uh, so, some, I suppose, do. But in two, it says, a servant who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully and will share the inheritance as one of the brothers. So here's an example where if you have a wise uh, employee, servant, uh, this isn't a slave. This is someone who is uh, employed in a household or, or is taken care of by a wealthier family in exchange for their, their labor. But in any case, if they're wise and, and wisdom is what? Faithfulness, contentment, et cetera, et cetera. A son who acts shamefully, yeah, the, the father, the head of the house is going to look down and say, hey, this is this is the guy that I want to uphold, not my rebellious son. Yes, I, I, I think, again, there, there is definitely truth to that, you know, in, in our day and age. We, we look at, uh, as you mentioned, you know, either people who have, you know, done really well in life or have been really blessed in life, uh, but they choose not to leave that inheritance to immediate family members. They they might leave it to to the employees of of the corporation that they've built up or or to one particular person. I think it's just I can't remember where in the context, uh, but I I believe I read an article was it last week sometime. There's a uh, 
very well-to-do person overseas uh, who, who did not leave any of his inheritance to uh, to anyone in his family, left it all to the gardener, the gardener that was mm. taking care of his estate. And, and so, uh, again, uh, this individual, for whatever reason or purpose, uh, was was dealing very wisely. And, and this individual saw that, took heed and notice of that and said, you know what? have it all you, you've done you've done so well in just the garden department you get the whole thing just take it mm. and so i yeah I, and uh, i i couldn't help but also think of the uh the the parable of the prodigal son too who's often being foolish and he himself though looks back and says even my father's servants are living a better life than me i think of that too Yes. Yeah. It, it, you know, and, and maybe that's the hope here is, is that there's a realization if, if someone is being the disgraceful son or the disgraceful daughter, that, that, that the Lord brings them to that realization, that recognition to say, don't continue to disgrace your family. Ultimately, you're really, in verses one and two, you're ultimately disgracing the giver of all these good gifts is, is really what's taking place here. And, and we don't want to, we don't want to live that way. Well, and it continues too because in verse three we talk about well, usually, and, and well, and Solomon does a great job because he takes these ideas of silver and gold, which are attached to wealth, but then he, I guess, points us to another test. The crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and the Lord or Yahweh tests hearts. So when you're melting down silver and gold, et cetera, et cetera, you're able to, you know, skim off the. The uh, I already forgot what it's called. The slag. The, yeah, you're able to dross. skim off the yeah the dross. You're able to skim off the impurities, basically. Well, and and you can tell if it's good gold or bad gold just by melting it down. Now, now Yahweh, he does the same thing, right, with our hearts, but tests hearts connected to a crucible and a furnace. Seems like that testing isn't always going to be pleasant. And 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 I believe. Uh... Not that it's my personal opinion, but we look at what the scripture says um, when we endure the trials and the difficulties of, of life uh, it really becomes reminiscent of, uh, of Jesus parable with the, the sower, the seeds and the different types of soil uh, is our faith one that when it is tested, uh, is it are we rooted in the shallow soil where the sun comes up and because there's no root going down deep. Uh, we fall away from the faith, or are we refined in the process? And again, truly pray and mean those words uh, that Jesus teaches us. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Whatever that will looks like, uh, that's not for us to decide. The Lord in his good grace, he knows what we need best, even if it doesn't seem best for us. And so um, oftentimes the world says, oh, you're suffering, you have know, did something wrong, God must not like you. And here we read the scripture where it says, no, the Lord, the Lord tests the heart and he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. And so he refines us, he draws us closer to him and ultimately purifies us here in time and there for eternity. And I'm glad you mentioned that he he purifies or refines us because, you know, you might say, well, if Yahweh, if God knows everything, he knows our hearts better than we know them ourselves. So why does he need to test the hearts? And I think that you've gotten to the heart of it. It's not just about like he's doing a little test to see if we're faithful or not, although, frankly, the Bible does talk in that type of language. But we see here from like Malachi 3, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to Yahweh. So we see yes. here that God isn't just testing to kind of see. He knows. He's testing so that we also are purified, that we grow. Right, right, right. Well, and, and we, we take that text, take Malachi and match it to match it to first Peter chapter one, verse seven, you know, Peter's saying all of this is leading to an outcome. Again, God's not just playing, you know, cat and mouse games here. And we're the little mouse trying to make it through the maze of life. And he comes along and bats us along with his, his divine paw every so often. No, this is, uh, this is for the glory and the honor at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When Christ returns, uh, we might not see it now as we're in that crucible, but all of it is leading mm. to an ultimate goal of his eternal goodness in us and through us. It's sanctification. It's sanctification. 
Yeah, we'd like to skip the crucible part, right? We'd like to skip yes, the do. refining <laughs> fire. Um, but then what What if you skip that when you are refining precious metals? Well, you get dull, not very lustrous, not very right. valuable, um, not sought after. It's 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 a poor product. I mean, so right. I think this is a great, a great, I mean, obviously it's great. The Holy Spirit uses it, but no, I think right. it's a great example right. for us. Now, we don't do a lot of smelting. Although I played around with that kind of stuff out in the garage, um, and I can tell you, it you know you watch these shows and it's not as easy as it looks. You have to know what you're doing, and and certainly well, we look to our heavenly Father to know how, what we need. Yes, and and he he does it so well, and and I believe the way that these verses are ordered, uh, not not to jump ahead of of you, but I look at verse three. I think it leads into verse four. If that isn't done. Uh, you know, if 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 we are standing in rebellion against the Lord and against His testing, uh, verse four leads us into what this life looks like and 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 how things could possibly turn out. And and it's a warning. It's a warning to us. Yeah, I see four and five connected also. So yeah, it's good. Let's go ahead and move on. So an evil doer listens to wicked lips, and a liar gives ear to a mischievous tongue. And then the next verse is, whoever mocks the poor insults his maker, and he who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. So it's almost like a little transition into uh, mm -hmm. not a new topic, but as you said, the results of what it looks like to be uh, someone who is unrefined. You know, an evildoer is listening to people who are out there speaking wicked things. Uh, a liar is, is, is leaning in to those who are looking to cause trouble with their tongue. And then, of course, mocking the poor is done with the tongue, and that is simply insulting his maker. Maker is capitalized there by the ESV editors, mm -hmm. and probably for a good reason, because it's referring to God. Yes, and so I think what we see here is is a uh, it, again, it's a it's a progression. You have, you have a wicked man, you know, listening to 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 wickedness or or a liar, paying attention to. To malicious and, and wicked tongues speaking things, which then ultimately in verse five, uh, we end up speaking out against the maker of even those individuals. And it's like verses four and five are a dangerous place to be just in in our life as individuals. You know, even if someone who might be listening and, and is not a believer yet might might be curious about who this God is, who what this Christian faith is all about. Why why should I stop living this way and start living uh, the way that he's asking us or calling us uh, to live? Well, because ultimately the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, all of us, all creatures of our God and King. And so if we're speaking out against anybody, especially in a malicious or, or a mean frame of mind or angry tongue, uh, we're ultimately doing that against the Lord. And, and that's just not, it's not a good way to be. It's not a good way to live here in time. And, and certainly we don't want to end up on judgment day uh, having to answer for every word that has been spoken as such. Oh, yes, no, no doubt. And, and when I read this too, whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. And I thought, okay, now who's, maker is it talking about <laughs> and then it took about five seconds before i realized oh yeah everybody <laughs> right yeah yes. uh, who mocks the poor insults the poor's maker but whoever yes. is mocking the poor also insults the maker of the mocker so so yes you know as you said we when we look out into the world and we see people who are not as well off as we are and for Americans, that's still most of the world. I'm just going to be straight mm -hmm. up with you folks. Yeah. Now, when, when we look at them, there is a temptation, uh, especially among Americans, to say that they're responsible for their unfortunate circumstances. Sometimes they are. Sometimes bad decisions in life have led to their circumstances. But in the, in the, in the past, and really even today, a lot of people lean on, well, maybe they're being punished for doing something wrong. I think of Job's friends, or maybe, you know, they brought hard times on themselves because uh, of their own folly, but they deserve it because, you know, I never make mistakes. Right. So, so even if, even if someone is sort of reaping the unfortunate rewards of their bad decisions, really because we're all when compared to Christ uh, deserving of, of death and hell and calamities and everything else, we really should look upon those as people for whom Christ died, people whom God loved, people that we should be compassionate toward. 
doesn't mean we continue to, you know, uh, let them have, make wrong decisions and get worse and worse. But I mean, how often do we hear, especially amongst uh, conservative folks like myself, you hear a lot where there's a lot of judgment against those who can't, for whatever reason, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, which really isn't a Christian idea. Yes. Yeah, I I agree. I, I absolutely agree. I, uh, a thought had just popped in my mind as, as you were sharing that. My, my mind went to uh, to our confession, the confession of our divine services. I, a poor, miserable sinner, all of us. Now, Solomon might be, you know, speaking of, of material wealth, the things that our eyes can see. Um, and so we do judge the outward appearance. But the, the ultimate truth is, is that uh, we are all poor sinful by nature mm -hmm. all of us are deserving of the wrath of god we, we we don't deserve so who are we to stand in judgment i guess at the end of the day uh, against those who might have materially less our concern ought to be as christians to say if i am blessed with materially more then let me share that with them because mm -hmm. those gifts are from the lord as well the giver of all those things and and so instead of standing and mocking those individuals uh, and again, not a not in a social gospel sort of way, uh, but to provide right. for their earthly needs while also reminding them of of their spiritual poverty, our spiritual poverty, and the giver of both of those gifts, the material, but certainly the spiritual gifts who blesses us. You mentioned uh, uh, poor, miserable sinner, which is you know mm -hmm. something that we Lutherans are very familiar with in our public and corporate confession. I saw a fellow, I think it was a pastor, and he he posted something on Facebook, and it was very standard Lutheran fare. I'll be honest, nothing shocking. I'm scrolling through. It says something about being a, a terrible, sinful person. It's like, oh, yeah, that's about right. I keep scrolling. But the first comment was someone who I can only assume isn't Lutheran who said something to the effect of, oh, you shouldn't talk about one of God's creatures that way, talking about himself. Like we shouldn't mm -hmm. say about ourselves that we're sinful because we're God's children and therefore – that's insulting to God's children. Well, that's not, I didn't sense that he or anybody else is saying it in a way that's mocking. It's a, saying it as a matter of fact, a matter of truth. But in this world, for us to say, well, sin and our own sinful natures, which we all possess, can lead to circumstances in our life that aren't very pleasant, then all of a sudden it's like we're being judgmental. No, we can be, and then we have to avoid that. But really, it's also important that we recognize our sinfulness and the sinfulness of others so that, of course, the gospel of Jesus can shine all the more brightly. Yes, I, I think that's a it's a beautiful way to put it. And, and would it be that the, the Lord, the ascended Christ, you know, who has given us the Holy Spirit would continually lead us in, in that direction, that self-examination first, and then we live that out in the world around us. Well, we got a little bit of a late start, so uh, you know, I apologize for that. Maybe we'll get a delay of game penalty, but we're going to go ahead and take a break. So, folks, don't go anywhere. We will come back, and we'll finish up our section through verse 14, but we'll have to after these messages. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today, it's the Reverend David Bass. He's the pastor of St. Michael Lutheran Church and School in Fort Myers, Florida. 
Don't forget, folks, that you can contact me at PastorBoo at gmail.com or on Facebook or by phone with your questions, comments, and more. That phone number is 1-800-730-2727. All right, Pastor Bass, let's head right back into the text. We have no time to spare, um, except I have to now open up my Bible. Here we go. Oh, yes, we do. We, we shift gears a little bit, or maybe not. Maybe you can connect them. I don't see much of a connection. It seems like a shift to me. But verse 6 says, Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their father's. But then in verse 7, it goes on to talking about fine speech is not becoming to a fool and false speech, etc. We'll get to that in a minute. So it seems like this is another one of those just kind of stuck in the middle of other verses that tend to connect. Am I missing something, or what do you think? Uh, no, I, I in looking at the, the text, it's almost like there's just some uh, – Thoughts that he wanted to to remind us of that, that Solomon's like, hey, and by the way, because we are all, uh, you know, crafted in the image of the Almighty, uh, and that's just not for here and now, you know, verses four and five, don't don't mock those, don't, uh, you know, don't mock anybody really, uh, and this goes uh, way back, uh, verse six, grandchildren, um, you know, mm-hmm. obviously had to come from somewhere, had to come from children, had to come from, uh, you know. Parents, grandparents, great grandparents. We we have fourth commandment here, don't we? Honor honor your father and your mother. Honor honor all those those adults who have been put in your life to teach you the faith, to lead you in those ways, and uh, and there's a blessing and an honor in that, isn't there? And and so again, uh, I think Solomon is is looking at life and is saying, number one, it's not worth you know living a life of of, of strife and nastiness. Uh, be an honorable uh, son or daughter uh, within your family. If trials and difficulties come, verse three, uh, know that the Lord is always with us. He's the one testing. He'll bring us through it. Don't be like an evil, wicked person. You know, don't don't say mean things. Don't, uh, you know, don't have a mean spirit about you and become that person uh, that lives long enough because you didn't speak evil and wickedness that someone may have, you know, taken your life, you know, uh, because of the things that you spoke, but that you see the blessings of of the generations that God is bringing forth from you. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, the glory of the children of their fathers. It's it's uh, what's what's the saying? I'm, I'm trying to remember it. Is it uh, grandchildren are are the, the the blessing that you get to see for for not messing up your own children too badly or some something to that effect? <laughs> it's. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, but you're right. You don't get grandchildren either unless you've lived to see them. And so there's also a connection to the longevity that comes with living a wise life that we've heard so far. Back in our last chapter, actually, in verse 31, it said, gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. So, you know, those who live righteously, the, the, the Proverbs often speak of them having long lives. We know that's a principle, not a promise. But then the glory of children is their father. So it goes both ways, too. God genuinely desires that we not only live out our faith, but have concerns for our children and our children's children. Uh, Back in Psalm 128, one of the references here is great. It says, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. I mean, isn't that the goal to settle in the promised land, to have a peaceable and quiet life? Raising your children up in the faith. That's the goal. Um, Yeah, it's a little idealized in a world beset by so much sin, but isn't that what we all want? And and so this really speaks to so many things. But one of the things that come to my mind are those parents who, and again, I think many of them are just misled, not mischievous, who say things like, well, I'm going to let my child decide what they want to believe when they grow up. Or I'm going to let them choose if they want to keep going to church after they're confirmed. Those types of things are, uh, well, a dereliction of duty. But at the same time, you know, don't you want to see not just grandchildren, but faithful grandchildren? Right. No, I I I concur 100 percent. And and I I see it actually where I'm currently serving here as as pastor at St. Michael within our handbell choir our our music director will tell you he has three generations of family so you've got the grandfather you've got the father and the 
uh, the grandchildren who are all playing handbells. So it is possible. It, it's this isn't wow. a, a you know a Pollyanna. Well, yeah, you know. Well, that's for Bible times, you know, or Psalm <laughs> Psalm one twenty eight or Proverbs seventeen. No, no, no. This is twenty twenty four right here in Southwest Florida. We're we're watching the generational blessings that the Lord brings upon His people. And so it, it is truly possible, and and we here at Saint Michael we are blessed to uh, to get to be part of that and and to see what that looks like. So, well, let's move on. Verse seven: Fine speech is not becoming to a fool; still less is false speech to a prince. The word "fool" here is to refer to the godless person that we've seen a couple times in Proverbs. Actually, all the way back to Proverbs. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's the fool we're talking about. Um, but fine speech is not becoming to such fools. Uh, false speech to princes. What is that telling us? I, th I think it, it tells us that we, we ought to have a reasonable expectation um, when we look at, at, at people who are either of, of noble character or are called to positions. I, I, I look at the office of the holy ministry. I mean, we God has called us to to fulfill this office on his behalf and, and for his people. How terrible would it be for us to speak words of, of deception? How horrible right. and misleading would it be for us to, to fall, proclaim a false gospel or to give people a false hope? Uh, the, the, these are cautionary words in in verse seven. Um, there's there's a warning here to say that if you have been called to, even if it's the most humble position, but if you are a a Christian, you're walking with the Lord. The Lord is walking with you. Uh, use whatever vocation God has placed you in to still speak honestly. Don't don't deceive, and especially. Uh, if, if you are called to to be the CEO of a of a company, if you're called to be the the president of you know uh, a, a nation, really, truly, don't speak deception. It's it, it number one. We don't expect it. Maybe we're a little bit cynical as Americans, where we we unfortunately look at you know political offices and say, well, we expect nothing. They open their mouth and speak nothing but lies. How refreshing would it be to not have to say that? Um, so yeah, well, even I, I even very faithful, I think lawmakers often are feel feel constrained to not speak the whole truth because they're afraid that well, out of context or without all the context they know, people might understand, and, and maybe in some cases that might be even wise. But it starts to expand to everything. You don't you just Ooh. sort of gloss over it, and, and I think people are so critical of our government because it also, I guess, helps us deal with the separation in power right so if you're someone without power and you have someone who has power then well frankly right. people are just going to bad mouth them because it makes them feel better and of course that's not what god calls us to do but that's what happens right and then so we again we we want to be sure to to steer clear of that and and we certainly don't want uh we don't want to live out verse seven uh and, and turn that into into verse eight i i, I look at those and i think those two uh, hang absolutely together. Uh, it's like one one is a warning to us. Verse seven is a warning, and and verse eight again is that uh, the result of what that can end up looking like. So that's how you see eight then. So really, as a description of what happens, not what we should do or what we should want to happen. I'm going to read that. I haven't read it yet. A bribe is like a magic stone in the eyes of the one who gets it. Wherever he turns, he prospers. So yeah, out of context and without thinking deeply, it seems like it's saying, "Hey, you want a, a good luck charm? Um, you know, then just go ahead and bribe people, and things will go your way." I mean, that's kind of what it it seems to be saying, but certainly isn't. <laughs> so, how do we understand it better? Well, I I look at the text, and and again, Solomon, because of his wisdom, uh, he's not saying we should do these things. He, he's saying this is unfortunately. Uh, how it it really appears that the fallen world works. It, it, this is uh, this is how things seem to 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 move along. And and we look at we look at the the early maybe even the present years of our country with with you know the 
uh, you know, the, the mobsters that would run within the cities, you know, bribery and extortion charges. And it, they're making things happen, yes, but how are they going about by making those things happen? Uh, and, and so it, it, it seems like it's a magic stone in the eyes of the one who gives it, not because Solomon is recommending that, but because it's an unfortunate reality of how sometimes life operates within a broken creation. Indeed. Let's keep on going. All right. I closed it out. Here we go. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. So love covers a multitude of sins. Um, that seems to be what we're getting at here. Yes, it, it absolutely is what uh, what Solomon is, is getting. And again, as, as a reminder, rather than living all the, the previous verses that, that we've come across, uh, let's let's cover those offenses not not excuse them uh, but rather forgive them all right uh, so so cover I, I look at as not like let's not pretend it never happened but let's address it honestly let's address it openly in a christian context so that love can cover it that love can take care of that and so that it doesn't get brought up again right it's it's confession and, and absolution if the sin is absolved right? We, we have a penitent sinner uh, that comes for private confession and, and absolution. We don't bring it up in the sermon the next Sunday and just simply change the name of the individual, but the matter <laughs> is completely closed. It's a done deal right. because the Lord has closed it. And so we being faithful in our office in that way, we, we address it. Um, and by addressing it, that's how we cover it with the love of Christ. 10. A rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. So it's These uh, are just it's fantastic. <laughs> well, yeah, it's more profitable to, you know, rebuke someone who's wise than to just beat the snot out of a fool. <laughs> At least that's how I'm seeing it. Uh, I, maybe there's well, some nuance there. <laughs> well, I, I, I look at this verse and... and a rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding. If if someone has caused an offense and, and you rebuke them, hopefully they're going to take it to heart. They're going to go, my gosh, I, I had no idea. I am so sorry. Rather than, you know, trying to address maybe that same issue with, with someone who has no understanding or little to no understanding, it, it, it'd be like trying to beat it into their head. And they're going, Right. I, I don't see it that way. I, I could care less about your thoughts, your feelings, your opinions. I don't care. But again, someone, uh, someone who is a, a person, a man of understanding, will really take that to heart and say, "My goodness, I had no idea it affected you that way." I, I, I apologize. And then that brings us right back to verse nine, right, where where the uh, the offense is covered with that love. And, and so, yeah, we don't want to be the fool that has to receive the hundred blows and still go, "I have." I could care less. I don't, I don't care. And and I know he's speaking of the fool versus the wise, but it also seems to speak to how we should interact with folks. I mean, to, to rebuke, and, and the assumption here is it's a rebuke that is not only deserved, but done in such a way that, you know, is is faithful, not not mean or malicious. So, so it's good for us to go out and, you know, reason with people, Rebuke is okay too. Proclaim, admonish, even, but then just to go out and kind of punish people, or at the hand of a sword, or even just verbally, continually kind of berate people—that's never going to bring about any positive change. It just doesn't seem like the that's a that's advisable. And yet, what do we see? We see so many people out there just kind of on the picket lines of life, telling other people of how awful they are and how they need to be. You know, they need to repent because the end is near. I mean, that proclamation of repentance must accompany, you know, a faithful desire for to see people saved, of course, come from God and, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and point people to Christ. Well, it, it, yes, ultimately, it is, is that rebuke, the, the, the signpost on the street corner of repent, uh, it, it might come across as being spoken in love from the person holding the sign. But do the people who are simply passing by on the street understand that as such? The, the context is, is out of place. Uh, how much better, how much different would it be to, to meet one-on-one -on -one 
with a maybe an unrepentant sinner, maybe even an, uh, an unrepentant sinner who is an unbeliever to help them understand. Uh, let, let's, let's speak the truth. You know, always be prepared to give an answer to the truth and the hope that lies within you. Always doing so with gentleness and respect. Uh, you know, a sign uh, blasting me on the street corner. I'm not sure that that's always gentleness mm -hmm. and respect versus a, a conversation uh, where you build a relationship with that individual first. And, and as the Holy Spirit works in both their heart and yours, um, then the Lord opens up doors for ministry opportunity. Uh, to take place yes always 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 spoken with love god's love but th that's what yep. we have to remember not not our own love not this fickle you know based on our thoughts feelings or emotions but his his love well and in relationship with people I, you know you talk about the people on the street corner i brought it up too you know i think the last time that i went to a senate convention it was in milwaukee i can't remember the year maybe 17 but anyway right outside the convention center there were uh there was a guy that came to sort of not protest but just mm -hmm. sort of a street preacher guy he had his little wagon had some books he had the sign and everything right outside the door and i kind of laughed because i thought you know in terms of efficiency going to tell people three thousand people lutherans to repent i mean we'll be receptive to that but maybe that's not best place for him to go to find people to bring to Christ. And, and but if you but if you talked with him, um he wasn't interested in talking about Christ, just interested in telling about other people how they're going to hell, you know. So th there there is a way. Um now let's look at 11 because we still see there's a wise and a foolish way to deal with things. An evil man seeks only rebellion and a cruel messenger will be sent against him. And I love 12. Let a man meet a she bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. Now, first of all, I always like it when they translate a she bear, but in this case, I think mama bear is probably the better translation. Uh, you know, a man, you'd be better off meeting a mama bear who's had her cubs stolen than to try to uh, run into a fool who is in the middle of his ridiculousness and unfaithfulness. It, 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 it. That's kind of sad, isn't it? You know that that uh, that Solomon would would write that he'd rather run into a, a a mama bear, an angry mama bear, rather than a fool. What does that say for the fool? You know, it 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 causes, or at least it, it ought to cause us to certainly again examine our heart, our life, our motives first and foremost to make sure that that we're not uh, that that person that individual that's just bent on on rebellion all the time you know and 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 don't, we don't stop at anything uh, until really the consequences of those actions are are met fully a cruel messenger will be sent against him isn't it uh isn't it uh, paul in, in in romans 13 uh that the the government government authorities are the agents of god's wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer, you know it's 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 unfortunate that that system has to be set in place, but it's it, you know again the God of all wisdom, he, he sees that that the structure needs to be put in place, not not for those who are living right and according to His word and His way, but for all those who seek to actively rebel against a, a good God, a God who loves, a God who who has nothing but our best interests in mind, and yet. They just refuse it and they reject it and they become a, uh, an individual of rebellion here in time. And, and ultimately, if there's no repentance uh, for all eternity. Oh, indeed. Right. I mean, verse 13, if anyone returns evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. I mean, we started talking about, you know, well, consequences of our actions and, and that this is one of them. Now, I would be remiss, though, if I didn't take just one step back, though, in, in sure. regards to uh, Solomon. Um, saying, well, listen, if uh, if I had to go in the woods with a, a bear or a fool, he would choose the bear. Now, if you're not quite not, sure not, why that's funny. Not just the bear, but a bear robbed of her cubs. I'm right, sorry. right. He'd rather have the mama, mad mama bear. Um, right. You, people at home, you may not have heard, there's this, this meme going around where women are saying that they would rather be alone in the woods with a bear rather than a man because of the viciousness probably the viciousness of men. Um, and uh, you can agree or disagree with that. It doesn't matter, but I just couldn't help but think about that. So, you know, Solomon chooses the bear 
too, as apparently most women do. Um, let's keep on going. We have two more. Uh, so I already read 13, but I'm going to add 14. If anyone returns evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. The beginning of strife is like letting out water. So quit before the quarrel breaks out. And so we added 14 to, I, I just like how matter of fact that is, you know, he, he starts off really poetically. The beginning of strife is like letting out water. So just stop it before you get in a fight. And I think that's probably the last word. Go ahead. Explain those verses to us. Unpack them. Uh, verse, verse 13, again, just such a word of, of warning. If, if you are, if you are causing evil, intentional evil, to someone again uh, if we are all made imagio if we're all made in in god's image uh, the evil that's going to be returned is is a divine judgment uh we we look at uh we look at solomon's own life right uh david uh, kills uriah takes uriah's wife Bathsheba. solomon mm -hmm. is the son and and what does the lord say the sword second samuel chapter 12 and verse 10, the sword will never depart from your house. So here's a man who who is living the reality of this. And, and the Lord's Holy Spirit moved Solomon to record this again for, for our knowledge, for our wisdom, for our understanding to say, don't do it. It's not worth it. Evil never pays. Evil never pays dividends that are beneficial to us here in time or for all eternity. And so verse 14, uh, don't start trouble. It, it's it's like it's like drilling right through uh, the Hoover Dam. It could be a half inch drill bit, but once that water starts flowing out, it will not quit. And before you know it, a, a flood and a torrent, either of angry words or angry emotions, hurt feelings, broken relationships is always the result of strife. Indeed, indeed. Well, folks, we're sort of getting to the end of our conversation, but it's interesting as we go through all of these Proverbs that the same types of themes continue to turn up and up again. Kind of makes it a little bit of a, you know, grind sometimes getting through them. But as our guest said, we have to keep being reminded of some of these things. We must continually have in front of us this reminder that we can and many do reject Christ and his will and his ways. His grace, while salvific, he doesn't make it um, uh, res uh, irresistible, right? We, we mm -hmm. do resist his grace and his goodness all the time. And so as I'm just looking through the verses that we talked about today, it just, it just reminds me that the way in which we interact with others is the it sets the stage for how we can share the good news with them. Yes. And so yes. being wise is oftentimes more about how you go about things than what you know, or even what you say. Yes. I, I look at, I look at this first portion of, of chapter 17 and, and even if we just meditated on this, you know, just, just take these 14 verses and read them for a week, just, Every single day, just meditate on these first 14. I, I strongly suspect that the Holy Spirit will absolutely use these words to, to maybe reshape some of our thinking, maybe some of our actions where, where we have failed in, in this manner, in these ways. And then also to look around and understand that the amount of blessing that God has poured upon us and in our life maybe maybe you are a grandparent maybe you're a great grandparent that's listening and, and you're taking stock of all the ways that the lord has has blessed you all the ways that that maybe evil could have been spoken against you and yet you did not respond in kind uh, you allowed the, the holy spirit to work and move in your heart and life you trusted christ even when the situation and like job you know, he had all these advisors saying, my goodness, you should this, or you should say that, or act this way, and you didn't. And the Lord sees, knows, understands, and blesses. He always does. Indeed, absolutely. Well, folks, I'd like to thank my guest this morning. It's the Reverend David Bass. He's the pastor of St. Michael Lutheran Church and School in Fort Myers, Florida. Brother, thanks for being on the show again. You're welcome. Good to be on the show, always. 
We'll talk to you again soon. Folks, tomorrow we'll wrap up Proverbs 17 with the Reverend John Lukomsky, co-host of Wrestling with the Basics right here on KFUO. But until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word.